Good evening. Welcome to part four of our series, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Dying and Death. One thing that you need to know for sure about death is, it is an appointment we are all going to make. Hebrews 9, 27 says that it is appointed for men to die once, and after this, the judgment. And we have the words of Jesus Christ about that himself in the Gospels, who did, in fact, literally die and come back from the dead, and who says he holds the keys of death and hell. So what did Jesus have to say about when a person dies? It's simply described in Luke chapter 16, the last half of that chapter. I don't believe it's a parable. It's often been called the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, but the Bible doesn't call it a parable. And Jesus names one of the characters. And nowhere in parables did he ever do that, name a character. So it seems like it's more a literal event or description of a literal event that takes place that describes the two destinies, and only two, that a man can have after his death. Let's read what Jesus wrote. Jesus said, there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue for I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, son, remember that during your lifetime, you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there's a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home, for I have five brothers and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, no, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, if they won't listen, to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Jesus says here at the point of death, there are only two destinies. First is the awful destiny of the lost. So this is kind of a bottom line kind of message. Some of you always want me to get to the point. So if you want me to do that, here it is. There is a heaven, there is a hell. Everybody is heading for one of them. God loves you and Jesus died for you so you should not go to hell but instead go to heaven. But the truth is some people reject God's love and end up in hell just like this man did in this story. Now in Luke 16 here, we learn a lot about hell. In fact, Jesus told us more about hell here than he told us about heaven which I think is very interesting. Number one, for instance, we learn that hell is a place of torment. Three times, Jesus said, there is fire there. The rich man said, I am in agony. I am in torment. Hell is such a terrible place that if you could ever understand the tragedy and the agony of hell, you would never, ever tell somebody to go to hell again. You would never wish that upon anyone. Not only would you not ever use those words about anybody else if you understood the agony of torment of hell, 
But if you ever heard the expression hell on earth, you would understand that as bad as it could ever get in this life in terms of physical pain or relational problems, there's no such thing as hell on earth. There's no experience that comes even close to the agony and torment of an eternal hell. That's the words Jesus used himself. But he also said that it is a place of awareness. Some people think that hell is going to be a place where there's no sensitivity or feeling. They believe in annihilation. That is, you just die and that's the end. You're annihilated. And, and frankly, I hope they're right. I wish that were true. I don't see any biblical evidence to support that being true, but I hope it's true. I wouldn't want anybody to experience what I read in the Bible about hell. You just die and that's the end. But Jesus said, this man woke up in hell and could see heaven. And he named names and he talked about his brothers back at home. I mean, I think what makes hell more agonizing by, beyond just the fire is the fact that people in hell are aware of people in heaven and aware of people back at home. They could see in heaven and could speak and they could see back on earth and think about those in their family who are still lost. Jesus suggests here that hell is a place of awareness. He also suggests it is a place of memory. In fact, maybe the scariest words in this dialogue between Abraham and the rich man are found in verse 25 when, G when Abraham said, Son, remember. Son, remember. And I think that if a person dies and goes to hell, they will remember. They will remember all of the opportunities and times that they had to accept Jesus and obey him. Hell is a place of memory, according to Luke chapter 16. It's also a place of regret. The rich man didn't enjoy being there, not one little bit. He said, I'm in torment. I am in agony. Some people honestly think, and I've heard this expressed, and I know you probably have too, that they're going to party and have a good time in hell. I've literally heard people say they're going to go to hell and have one big long beer party for a long time with their friends. No, you're not. No one in hell wants to be there. I mean, I, I love to read Mark Twain and he was very talented but he was really off base when he made this absurd statement go to heaven for the climate hell for the company he was greatly deceived about that because I can assure you no one in hell wants to be there the rich man begged father Abraham take care of me I am hurting and and just dip the tip of Lazarus's finger in the water to touch my tongue. And Abraham said, I'm sorry. Nobody can cross the gulf. There's a great chasm. And you know what became then a rich man's concern? He had five brothers still alive. Well, we'll send Lazarus to preach to them and tell them to repent. So in other words, he knew what it took to be saved. He said, send Lazarus telling them to repent. And if we could send a television crew to hell to interview people there, I think the one thing we would hear over and over again is, warn my loved ones, warn my friends, do not come to this place of torment. The number one concern, I think, of people in hell would be the same as the rich man's here. Don't let anybody else come to this place because it is a place of great regret. Now, I know the question that always gets asked when the subject of hell is brought up, and that's why you don't hear much about the subject anymore. But in a, in a, in a series where we're talking about everything you need to know about dying and death, you, you have to address the truth that the Bible teaches on this subject. But the, the question that always comes up is, how could a loving God send people to hell? In fact, it comes up so much, most people don't even believe in hell. According to the most recent Gallup poll that I could find on Google, 68% of Americans believe there is a heaven, almost 7 out of 10 people, but only 38% of people in America believe there is a hell. 
So people just deny the fact. Now, I can't quite understand why the same Bible, the same writing, the same document that teaches about heaven and hell, and actually probably has more to say about hell than it has to say to heaven, produces 68% of people who believe in heaven and less than half of that who believe in hell. I don't quite get that. I don't understand that. So people want to deny the fact that there is a hell. And if there is a hell, they want to deny the fact that God would send anybody there. But according to Matthew 24, 25, 41, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. That's why hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. When the devil rebelled against God in heaven, according to Isaiah chapter 14, it was never created for human eternal habitation. The truth of the matter is some people are going to end up there forever. The rich man did. And maybe more people are heading to hell than are heading to heaven. Matthew 7 says that many people who think they're going to heaven are not actually. But God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. For instance, 2 Peter 3, 9 says the Lord isn't really being slow about his promises. Some people think he's being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but everyone to come to repentance. That's what the Bible says. I remember very vividly several years ago studying with a man, studying the Bible with a man and trying to, uh, trying to convert him to Christianity. And when we were talking about these two destinies, he finally just blurted out. He said, I just got to be honest with you, Randy. I don't believe in hell. I don't. And I don't know what caused me to, to respond the way that I did, but I just simply stated, well, you better be right. Well, you better be right. I mean, this is not something you can afford to be wrong about. And I got to be honest with you. I don't think it's easy to get to hell from Southwest Florida. I think you got to try. I think you've got to belligerently try to get to hell from Southwest Florida and most of America and most of the world. I mean, God has given us so many ways to hear and learn the gospel, so many opportunities to see truth given in the scripture. And God has given us so many warning signs to try to block us from making the decision to disobey or not believe him. Imagine someone's driving down the interstate and they see a flashing sign that says, Danger, bridge out, one mile, detour ahead. And a half a mile later, they see another sign that says, Danger, bridge out, half a mile, detour ahead. And then they drive another several hundred feet and they see danger, bridge out, a thousand feet, merge left. There are flashing signs and cones and barriers across the bridge being repaired. But what if somebody driving just hits the accelerator and drives right through all the barriers and into the water. Would somebody say, how can our highway department be so cruel as to send somebody to their death? No, of course you wouldn't say that. And God has set up warning after warning and sign after sign for every single one of us about hell. Two destinies. Two destinies. But there is a second destiny, and that is the destiny for a Christian. <clears throat> if you are a believer, five seconds after you die, you will find yourself in paradise. That's the word Jesus used speaking to the thief on the cross. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. The word paradise is not translated from the Greek language. It is transliterated, and it literally means perfection or perfect garden. There is some thought that it may be a reference back to like the perfect garden in the Garden of Eden, God returning things to the sinless state where they began. The word paradise has connotations of greenery and beauty. And heaven is a place that can be referred to as paradise because it is absolutely beautiful. It is a literal place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Revelation talks about the streets of gold and the gates of pearl. 
We simply do not have language that expresses the kind of glories and wonder and beauty that we'll see in heaven. It's not available to us. And so 1 Corinthians 2, 9 simply says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. I love the old story about an avid golfer. After he died, he asked an angel, are there any golf courses up here? And the angel said, you ought to see them. I'll take you on a tour tomorrow. And he took the golfer to the most beautiful golf course imaginable compared to this heavenly golf course, Augusta National, looked like a pig pen. Perfect clubs, you always shoot under par, the fairways were immaculate, the greens were perfect, it was absolutely beautiful. And when the golfer saw it, he began to cry out loud and the angel said, I thought you'd be happy. Why are you crying? And the golfer said, if it wouldn't have been for that low fat, high fiber, low carbohydrate diet, I'd have been here 10 years earlier. Heaven is such a wonderful place. But you don't need to go there before God's timing. Seconds after you die, though, the angels will have escorted you to paradise. Jesus said to the man on the cross, who expressed belief in him, today, 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 you will be with me in paradise. Now, the Bible says that the rich man was buried. Undoubtedly, he had lots of, um, he had lots of resources and had a nice place to be buried. Lazarus was also buried, but they probably threw him on a garbage heap. That was the customary thing to do for beggars back in that day. But that was only his body. His soul and his spirit were already in Hades. Lazarus' soul and spirit were already in paradise. There you will be furnished with a new body. That's good news for any of you who've ever been pain and felt like you were in a losing battle against your body. This body gets old. This body gets worn out no matter how much you stretch it, tuck it, lift it, and exercise it. It's still gonna wear out, it's still gonna hurt, and ultimately it is still gonna pass away unless the Lord comes before then. This body is literally gonna die. It's finite, it's temporary. The Bible says we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven and an eternal body, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. In fact, most of us will have three bodies, actually. Number one is our earthly body, the one we're living in now. It gets sick. It gets tired. It has to have some sleep. It's prone to illness and disease. It breaks down. It wears out. But when you are inside that body, it's like living in an earthly tent. That's what this verse says. It's like living in an earthly tent. Your soul and your spirit and your personality is inside that. Someone has described it as like being in a space suit, except you might call it an earth suit. We wear it for perhaps 70 or 80, or if you're lucky, 90 years in this environment, but it's gonna die and it's gonna be buried. And when the body ceases to exist, then your spirit and soul goes immediately to be with the Lord. Paul said, we are confident that we would rather be away from these earthly bodies. For then we will be at home with the Lord. And that's when we receive the second body, that is a heavenly body. You move out of one body and you move into another in a matter of nanoseconds. There's a famous old cemetery in Wetumpka, Alabama. My sister-in-law lives there and has verified that this story is true, where a man named Solomon Pease was buried and it says, Solomon Pease, Pease is not here, only the pod Pease shelled out and went home to God. That's exactly what happens to a Christian when he dies. Who you really are departs and you receive a heavenly body. And then there's body number three, and that is the resurrection body. Now put a little bit of an asterisk beside that. 
for those of us who are alive when Jesus comes back, we'll skip number two. We'll skip paradise and we'll immediately be turned into the resurrection body. My father died in 1989. The moment he died, his soul and his spirit went to be with Jesus. And he has body number two, a heavenly body right now. And there's so much information about this. I mean, you're not going to become an angel when you die. You're not going to be a spirit floating around playing a harp in the, in, in the clouds, eating Milky Way candy bars. You'll have a heavenly body, as my father does right now. Well, what about his earthly body? It's in a grave in Nashville, Tennessee. What's it doing? To be honest, it's decaying. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 says, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, then the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 says, since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to live again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. So the soul and the spirit will be reunited with that eternal resurrection body. God will take what is left of that earthly body and reform and reshape it into a resurrection body. What about those Christians who were cremated or died at sea or by fire or by some other tragic event like say 9-11? Well, those of you who study physics understand nothing in the universe is ever lost. It may be converted from matter to energy or energy to matter, but it is never completely lost. So don't worry about that. The God who created the entire universe from nothing won't have any problem at the second coming of Jesus speaking the word and poof. All the molecules that he needs will come back together and reform a resurrection body. Philippians 3.21 says he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. And you will have, according to the Bible, a new body for all eternity. Not exactly like the one you have now, but a new improved version, a version of a body that will not hurt, it won't get tired, it won't get sick, and it will never ever die. One of the things I love about the description of heaven is, in Revelation 21, four, he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these things are gone forever. Never again in heaven will you go to the hospital to visit a loved one. Never again in heaven will you have to hear about social distancing or COVID-19. Never in heaven will you ever have to hear about cancer. Never in heaven will you have to go to a funeral service because in heaven you will have a new perfect resurrection body. I often get asked, do you think we'll know each other in heaven? I kind of believe we do. The Bible's not direct on that, but there's circumstantial evidence. And the text we've looked at today provides some of that circumstantial evidence where the rich man in hell looks up into heaven and says, sin, Lazarus. He didn't say, who is that beside you? He said specifically, sin, Lazarus. And if someone in hell can recognize someone in heaven, I certainly think it's possible that someone in heaven can recognize each other in heaven. Maybe even as we see clearly face to face, as 1 Corinthians 13 says, even better than we know each other right now. And of course, the greatest thing of all about heaven is that we'll be face to face with Jesus. As much as you want to see your loved ones and your family and your friends who have died, I think that will pale in comparison with your desire to see the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then... 
I will know everything completely just as God now knows me completely. In other words, right now, spiritual truth and spiritual reality is like looking into a foggy mirror when you're shaving in the morning. But even looking through that poor mirror, you know what is there. You know you just don't see it as well. But when we see Jesus face to face, how much better it's going to be. Each year, this beautiful creature, a monarch butterflies, descend upon Pacific Grove, California. They lay their eggs in the pine trees and then fly away to die. When the larvae turn into butterflies, they eventually fly away, get this, only to return to the same place, entomologists believe, to the very same tree. How do they do that? They don't have the navigational instruments. It's instinct that their creator has given them. I believe our creator has placed within each of us a desire to see the creator, to be with the creator, to return to the one who created us, who loved us, and who wants to save us forever in heaven. God has voluntarily restricted his omnipotence and has allowed it to be controlled by an area of your free will. He won't force you to trust and obey him and go to heaven. You are not some computer where he pushes the enter key and then you fall on your knees and repent. He wants you to choose to obey him. It's up to you, but it's the most important decision you will ever make because it's the decision to lead you to one of two destinies. In our last lesson in this series next week, we're going to talk about how to prepare for that ultimate appointment. God bless you.